it's so great to have your company here today. Uh, it's our special masterclass with David Holmgren focusing on retro suburbia as uh, a special urban agriculture month event. So thank you for being here. It's great to see you. Before I begin, could I just remind everyone to have themselves on mute uh, until we get to the question bit. And if you want to open up your mic then and ask a question, we'd love you to do that. Um, if you would like to ask a question throughout, um, please use the chat function. Um, Clinton is here and he's looking out for questions and making sure that uh, they get added in. We have a lot of people um, booked in uh, for this session. Uh, I think there was something like 757 people registered for this event, so we're delighted at the response. If by chance your question doesn't get answered um, here, I would love for you to still share it with us and we might compile them and see if, um, you know, David and I could prepare some responses or something that we can send later on. So, um, yeah, please keep those coming. Also, I would like to, before I go any further, acknowledge that I'm calling in to you here from the unceded lands of the Gubby Gubby and the Jinnaburra and would like to pay my respects to elders past and present. I would love to for you to drop in in the chat where you're calling in from. So if you know the, in, the Indigenous country on where, which you're seated, um, please drop that into the chat. That would be fantastic. Um, and so I think we've got most people coming in now. Uh, maybe we can begin. Uh, I would like to warmly welcome David Holmgren to our masterclass tonight, our special on retro suburbia. As I said before, this is a, a masterclass that's hosted by the Permaculture Education Institute. We do this every month on the last Monday of every month. And uh, this is a special event, obviously, because we have David with us here and also because it's Urban Agriculture Month. And so we've been collaborating with Urban Agriculture Month all, all November to bring podcasts and conversations around how do we how do we address uh, bringing our food system closer to home, closer to our suburbs and our cities, and so retro suburbia uh, is a perfect uh, end to this month to bring all these different threads together and to to talk with David um, about his perspective on all of this. So David, as you know, because you've booked into this, David is the co-originator of permaculture. He's the author of, um, ah, sorry, I've got tennis over, I have to use my other hand, <laughs> um, a Retro Suburbia, this amazing manual that came out um, a couple of years ago now, uh, illustrated by uh, Brenna Quinlan, um, which has its um, sister book, the children's version, Our Street. And uh, so here tonight, we're talking about Retro Suburbia and how it can help us to address uh, the global situation we're in, focusing on uh, growing food in and around the suburbs and all the other things that retro suburbia is. So welcome, welcome, David. Welcome to the masterclass today. Thanks, Morag. And it's great to be joining you uh, you from uh, Jajorawang country in central uh, Victoria um, and our home in Meliodora, where we've lived for the last 35 years and we're the ideas of retro suburbia were were hatched, I suppose, over those um, uh, decades. Mm. So um, for everyone listening, David is, um, as I said, the co-originator of, of permaculture, um, basically coming out of your research, I understand, at university and your postgraduate research uh, with uh, and that Permaculture One came out of that. And since then, you've also authored a number of other books, including um, the princi uh, Permaculture Principles and Pathways Beyond Sustainability and the book around about your place. So a designer, an author, a futurist and a retro suburbia advocate. So what, David, would you describe as being retro suburbia in your, in your words? How do you describe it? Yeah, well, it's interesting, you know, in reflecting back when we moved to the small town of Hepburn, Dalesford, and our intention was actually to buy a house, retrofit the house, and do something like retro suburbia. 
And because it was a small town and there weren't too many houses for sale and the streets didn't run east, west or north, south, so that there weren't many houses with a long east, west axis, uh, which is like one of my sort of hardline things for retrofitting for passive solar in a, a cool temperate climate. And I had the experience of being an owner builder and the tools. So we decided to build from scratch, but actually those ideas of retro suburbia were uh, there uh, back in those days. But I'll, I'll just share the uh, screen here and um, uh, to answer that question, I suppose for me, retro suburbia is really a pattern language of retrofitting three fields that really summarize uh, what uh, suburban living always involves. The built environment, buildings, um, technology, water tanks, all that sort of stuff, the biological uh, gardening, and especially with an emphasis on food, but livestock and that uh, very strong connection to uh, uh, urban agriculture, and also uh, the behavioural field uh, of all of the way we organise how we live. And that that's all governed and empowered by permaculture ethics and design principles. And I just threw in there Richard Telford's little sketch plan of his incredible uh, case study site um, in the book and uh, on the Retro Suburbia uh, website, Abdullah House in another country town in Victoria, Seymour, um, where he's done a fantastic job of, uh, of documenting uh, that process. So David, why why are you focusing on the suburbs? What for you is you I've heard you say before that it's a sweet spot. Can you say a little bit more about that? Why, you know, in much of the conversation, often in environmental movements, the the suburb is this much maligned place. What do you see? Yeah. Look, I think firstly, it's where most Australians live. And really importantly, an even higher proportion of children live there. And so the next generation that's going to face a very different world uh, from the current one, in the opinion, I think, of a lot of people now, but certainly permaculture from the beginnings, being based on that assumption that we're heading for very, very different uh, worlds. So where and how children are raised is really important to that. Um, so in that sense, it's relevant to a huge number of, of people. And it's surprising, even beyond the Anglo-American world, you know, countries like Canada and New Zealand, uh, the US, um, where this suburban pattern is the predominant one. And it's amazingly how much that pattern has spread uh, to other countries as well. But in terms of what you were saying about the sweet point uh, between having access to sun, soil, water, and other essential resources that we associate with rural localities. And then on the other hand, the social diversity and economic connectivity that we associate with higher density urban localities. And that is um, a place where you can uh, work or redesign the best of, of both those worlds. And one of the slides we use to illustrate that in terms of especially the garden farming potential of different scales of land use. So this slide from, from the, uh, the book indicates we can grow food at right down at the scale of one square meter you know, in containers and, and pots and right through to sort of rangeland management where, um, well, you know, whether it's wild kangaroo is harvested or other food products that we 
might consume. And the suburban scale um, is, you know, in the middle of that. And so if we think about growing in containers at the suburban context, there is that uh, greater freedom. Not as much freedom as in rural areas, but you've also got that other benefit of urban environment of the social diversity and connectivity. And you know, by social diversity, sometimes people mean oh, all, all different ethnic uh, groups and whatever. And yeah, that's part of it, but it's just actually about things like kids finding other kids in the neighborhood that they get on with or connect with or click with. Whereas in rural areas, you know, there's a limited number of people that you have uh, to interact with as, as options uh, without doing the, the massive commute long distances. Yeah, that's really true, David. Sorry I disappeared there for a minute. We, we had a bit of a storm <laughs> and I, I vanished and um, I hope other people are back again now. So um, sorry for jumping out on you just then. Uh, that's I, okay. <laughs> I, want, I did want to ask you about um, this, uh, the difference between what you see in terms of, you know, the focus often on urban um, urban agriculture with, you know, vertical gardens and rooftop gardens. Um, I struggle a little bit with that. And I'm just wondering what, what you were, what your perceptions of those are and whether that is, the reason why I struggle with it and why I'm asking you is because I see a lot of energy and money going into developing those and whether there might be more availability of, of space in and around those areas that we could focus on that could be more productive possibly. I'm yeah, sure. what do you think? I'm, I'm a bit of a sceptic about the sort of high density built fabric being transformed. There's definitely a role for rooftop gardens. I'm more sceptical about building facade green walls you know uh, some of these uh, things the the management complexities and the infrastructure complexity uh, of these sorts of things um, there's definitely potential uh, with things like basement um, uh, food production with mushroom farms and um, you know various Micro potential and, yeah uh, aquaponics but yeah I see the main, design solution for higher density residential areas is the traditional European uh, community garden allotments within walking or bicycling distance where you get away from the big high buildings that are shading everything and you have a whole lot of allotments and uh, or you know collective uh, gardens that are managed but they don't have uh, managed by people from those residential places. But because of the separation, you don't have the super efficiencies and the intimate connections that happen with garden farming. And mm. it's that permaculture zoning idea that right at the back door type of thing, all of those interactions with the household that make garden farming so uh, much more uh, productive and uh, adaptable to an integral part of the way people live. Yeah. Now that doesn't mean to say that you know um, community allotment gardens aren't a, a, a good uh, solution, but th that that was the traditional solution to pe people in cities growing their own food. Because of course, in the past, people in higher density cities did grow their own food on yeah on allotments. Um, further yeah. away so I'm not sure whether you covered it when when my power went out but I wonder um whether you wanted to talk a little bit about what you think makes sense to grow at this garden farm scale yeah yeah well in this um extended online essay feeding retro suburbia from the backyard to the bioregion went sort of beyond the the contents of retro suburbia, which is focused on what people can do at home to see how that fits in to creating a whole bioregional food system. And I, uh, I suppose, am sort of, uh, you know, fairly uh, 
realistic rather than idealistic about that um, issue of people producing all of their own food at the, the backyard scale. It may actually technically be possible, but actually the sort of vision I have of the relocalized food system is that uh, garden agriculture or garden farming as part of the household economy might end up being about a quarter of um, uh, what people consume and about more than half of that would be veggies um, and maybe a quarter fruits and you can see a whole lot of slice of, of other things there and that what I call urban agriculture, I mean by that uh, community or commercial uh, growing that's happening in the city or the immediate uh, peri-urban uh, fringe of, of cities. But it's essentially either commercial or it's collective, communal in some way, but it's not uh, strongly connected to houses. And in that, there may be more grains and um, legumes and stronger potential for dairy, which is sort of we've got as a very thin slice on the on the the garden ag side, but it's still dominated by veggies. And then out from the rural ag, we're getting our cereals um, and dairy and um, uh, larger rangeland uh, products. And then there's these two little circles one called rural wild foraging, um, harvesting, and urban wild uh, foraging and harvesting. So I think it does make sense to concentrate on the strengths that our forebears understood that in garden farming, you're growing uh, fresh fruit and veggies and small livestock products like eggs from, uh, from chooks and uh, those sorts of things because it's more energetically efficient to do those things really close to where people live. And in an energy and climate constrained world, it's inevitable that this fruit, fresh food sector will be the first to be relocalized mm -hmm. and what I call deprofessionalized in that it's returning to the household and community non-monetary economy, because that was the part of the food system which was the last to be commercialised and industrialised and globalised. Before we talk more about that household economy, I'm wondering whether, um, whether you just want to comment on that in this picture here, what kinds of change of perception of what kind of diets we need to have and I know this is going to be different from different areas yeah. but what do we need to embrace there um, for making this possible yeah well that was something we explored and came up with for this to work it's sort of based around what we call the retro suburban diet and it's not a diet in the sense of a prescription of what people sh should eat but it's a description of what would co-evolve naturally in uh, a, an economic and climate uh, and energy constrained world, people pursuing this sort of self-reliance, what would they be eating? And then we gauge that relative to the standard Australian diet, which is the sort of average statistical diet. And what that showed is that there needed to be a huge expansion in the consumption of vegetables and a downgrading in the amount of dairy products that people consumed compared with the current Australian diet. Um, and proteins? In, Where do you see the main source of proteins uh, in the register? Well, diet? The, the proteins uh, might still, a lot of them be animal, but they would be in things like eggs um, and small livestock products but also, yes, an expansion of legumes. Um, so, you know, I mean, of course, you can get that by some people being vegetarian and some people being meat eaters. It, it's sort of like, you know, how it sort of averages out. 
So we saw an expansion of cereals and grains and legumes uh, and vegetables. But um, interestingly, fruit, Australians currently consume a lot of fruit, but mostly in the form of processed juices and stuff like that. So um, uh, from our learnings of what would be a healthy and balanced diet, and especially in, with our bias for our cool temperate bioregion in the southeast of the continent, uh, we would see um, the, the level of fruit that a lot of permies are pretty obsessed with, but you know, with their really abundant food forests, might not be the optimal thing for making best use of limited space and best for dietary uh, balance and health. And that's certainly one of the learnings we've come from here of, in a sense, you can end up eating too much fruit and too much acidic fruit, um, of course, is bad for teeth um, almost as much as <laughs> uh, sugar. Um, so that's some of the learnings. Of course, once you bias that into the subtropics and the tropics, there's good reasons in a productive sense for having a higher proportion of foods uh, from tree crops. Mm. So it does depend, you know, it's that interaction between what's the environment naturally want to grow um, and is most efficient and productive at doing so, and what is a good sort of overall balance for diversity and um, uh, you know, health. But it's a it's a tricky subject, obviously, which we did tackle. Of uh, and it is, it can get quite um, quite political in a way, can't it? So, oh, but oh, I think it, you know, just the idea of bringing it into a bioregional focus, and then into into a neighbourhood focus, and then into your backyard, and really like you've mapped out here. And yeah. so let's let's sort of um, take the conversation then back into that home context because a lot of what you're talking about with retro suburbia is a focus on the economy of home and really about this focus on reciprocity and of gifting and I wonder whether you could just speak a little bit about that in this sort of context of how that fits into really helping to bring forth a, a retro suburban uh, local food system. Yeah yeah well I suppose um, this powering up of the non-monetary economy, I mean, a lot of people, for a lot of people, the whole concept of a non-monetary economy is weird because they sort of think of um, gardening and other things they do at home from washing the dishes to fixing the car and cleaning out the gutters is just, well, that's just life. Now, it's actually part of an economy where we sustain ourselves, but not with monetary uh, exchange. And historically that has happened most strongly with people who live together uh, in some sort of household. Um, and of course, a lot of those households historically have been predominantly families and often extended families. But the huge opportunities to replace a lot of what people depend on through the system, through the monetary economy, and connect on more equal terms uh, in households and in the neighbourhood. Um, so that is uh, really involves uh, where people are doing things. If we think uh, mother preparing food for kids, that is actually part of a gift economy. You know, there's not an expectation of payment in sort of really any direct form. Um, and that's actually what our ancestors lived with. They didn't live uh, predominantly with barter. Um, and this is one of the lies that is taught in economics uh, at universities that people say that our oh, money was necessary to put, replace the inefficiencies of barter. And that's completely false. Barter for was dealing with foreigners, mm -hmm. people you don't know whether you can trust to operate in a gift economy. So, okay, you've got that. Um, I've got this. How about we swap? 
So that's how you deal with people you don't know or don't know whether you can trust. <laughs> so that's what money replaced. But most of what people's needs were were provided within a gift economy where the reciprocity, it's sort of like an insurance system. Yeah, you might get something back, but not directly from that person, from some other person. Now, of course, that extended out beyond the household and beyond uh, kin um, to community, but its core basis is a household. Uh, and even our a lot of our modern households don't have that. We have a lot of households where people buy their own food and cook separately in the kitchen, all sorts of things which are just super inefficient, you know, so that this, um, I think this uh, table um, chart that uh, Brenna Quinlan did sort of shows a lot of the, the things operating within the monetary economy and the alternatives uh, to that. And so that is across such a wide range of areas. And I remember I had a guy who was um, on a course who um, said he worked in a, uh, uh, an IT uh, business where they had hot uh, desking everywhere and he went with his laptop and with retro suburbia underneath it to set his laptop on and people would ask him what's that big blue book you've got there and he would open it up at this page and all these people in these really stressed highly paid jobs would look down this um, poster and go oh right <laughs> and it was his best distillation of what retro suburbia <laughs> was about uh, so obviously just... food is only part of that equation but it's an incredibly important uh, part of it yeah I was just going to say I mean I think what what is at the basis of this too is it's not just you or me in our house shifting to this it's about building up that web of relationships with our neighbors with people down the street with people in the street over with people you know in the local you know region so yep. um can you maybe describe a couple of examples of how you've seen this expansion from the household to a neighborhood through retro suburbia examples or even just you know pushing down fences or what it might be like and what are some of the things that unlock that possibility for people too i uh, yeah well i wonder whether i've got um i haven't got the image of the the um, book cover um, uh, large, but um, one of the places we visited fairly late in the in the research um, uh, um, for the book was a place called Hibby Farm in um, in suburban Melbourne, and that was a place where people had started a core. Um, uh, on a particular block and then other people had bought and rented nearby and created a bit of a critical mass of what was called informally the hood, the, the neighbourhood, um, starting at this um, end of a, a cul-de-sac street. And they're the folks on the cover and, you know, two sisters and their husbands sharing a two-bedroom house with their kids living a largely outdoor lifestyle um, with uh, two part-time at-home incomes, uh, one three-quarter time uh, work away from home and one uh, complete home-focused um, uh, person. And the amazing household efficiencies of their household and then the interconnection with their uh, backyard goats and other people who shared the milking and uh, different things that were sort of unfolding from that um, uh, initial cell. So that was really interesting to see that. And it sort of reminded me a little bit of what's happened with intentional communities in rural areas where sometimes there's the core people who've got a lot of 
commitment and are part of a, a truly intentional community of shared ownership. And then there's the people around who sort of were in the community or uh, wanted to be associated with that and are living on rural properties just nearby and go to various events. And, you know, we see this in the local um, ashram community where we hold our uh, permaculture design courses. There's various people around who are part of that network, but are not so, if you like, collective as the people in the core of it. And it felt like um, uh, the folks at, at the core of Hibby were a, a, a bit like that. They were, you know, a higher level of commitment and pushing the boundaries than some of the others. But the sense of collectivity and the kids playing in the streets and just going everywhere around was pretty exciting. And when uh, uh, Oliver and I went there and Oliver was um, doing the uh, some of the uh, more professional photography for retro suburbia and we were going and visiting these various places and I uh, he said so what's this next one and he was playing the sort of the hard professional photographer what do you want me to photograph and I said I don't know you know we'll have to see when we get there and we got there and um, after a while uh, Oliver just got so excited he said we've got to come back here and take the cover photo and it's got to be something that says to my generation, his generation, he's, uh, he was 32 at the time, um, that I want that life now. Mm -hmm. And so this photo, which is a set up photo, but it's actually completely real. And it was a bizarre experience because um, at one point, he, the photographer, was saying, ah, oh, I think that number of kids on the back of the bike is a bit unrealistic, a bit over the top. And they said, no, we do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, you know, it is it is real, everything uh, in that. Uh, uh, what response have you had, David, to Retro Suburbia, around, like both in Australia but around the world? I mean, how have people responded to this? Uh, call to rethink what we're doing in our suburban areas? Yeah, well, I, th I think it's been um, really acted as a sort of uh, a huge boost indirectly to people coming to permaculture who uh, were maybe uh, saw themselves differently from being, uh, you know, sort of radical greenies or or back to the landers. And um, I think it sort of has been very positive also from a lot of uh, sustainability professionals working in local government who are looking at where do we get the next iteration of more radical integrated approaches that are relevant to their constituents in, in council areas. and. Um, that's been really encouraging to see uh, so many local councils sponsor events and um, talks and uh, whatever. Yeah. And also um, the sort of influence that's sort of happening back the other way, like in terms of uh, what does garden farming look like in practice? I mean, one of the, the case studies in the um, in the book is Cat Laver's uh, property in, in Melbourne. And she is a permaculture designer, teacher, uh, gardener uh, and owner, but she's also a professional in um, developing the My Smart Garden program for, for various uh, inner city councils in Melbourne. And then you know, extending out that knowledge uh, uh, and a lot of it sort of really basic stuff, you know, why isn't my compost working properly and all of those sorts of things that people becoming food producers at home for the first time um, uh, need, uh, you know, uh, and her place, this is a, a photograph we took um, uh, as part of the 
uh, at the time back in 2017, you know, 115 square metre garden and 271 square metre block. Um, and, you know, quite a, uh, a lot of limitations of space, soil contamination and pest animals, the, the possum problem. Um, and this permaculture design system that includes quails and, and bee, bees feeds the household the majority of its fresh produce while generating some surplus for barter. And I think that um, example is incredibly inspiring. I mean, that's the table that we included in Retro Suburbia of Kat's produce because she weighs everything, measures everything. Um, and this is sort of basically from uh, less than a day's work a week. But there's those figures um, of the more recent data, you know, really heading up to looking like half a ton of food from approximately 100 square square meters. And she said to me the other day that, you know, oh, I should give you some more um, uh, decent photos. And I thought, um, going back to that photo, I think that's a great photo because it actually shows the structure of the garden. But of course, she's constantly improving and uh, selecting things. And there, there it is in sort of peak summer productivity. And this is it in the Melbourne winter with all the brassicas and the deciduous trees. And I think a citrus tree there's got three different um, uh, citrus grafted on the one tree and a spalliate against the wall. Whoops. Um, where are we there? And yeah, the little photo showing the, the deck and I love her um, outdoor barbecue that's actually a seed raising um, uh, table. And I suppose it, it sort of portrays just one example of what garden farming uh, might look like and its productivity. But it's also important in retro suburbia, we, um, we wanted to emphasize how there's lots and lots of different approaches and uh, different people have different styles and, and preferences. And we made this matrix from the rational on the left side through to the intuitive uh, on the right side and sort of intensive and high yielding approaches uh, on the top and the more sort of natural self-maintaining approaches on the bottom. Now, as you go down to smaller and smaller spaces, if you want to actually produce food, then you end up in this intensive high yielding sort of sector to some degree or another. Whereas if you've got more space you, and not much so much time, then the sort of natural, more self-maintaining uh, approaches make sense. And we've just thrown different um, uh, organic and permaculture authors and different systems on that chart to sort of indicate where they we think they sit. Um, and you can see me here in the um, uh, sort of on the rational side of the ledger rather than the intuitive side, but close in to the centre and um, more on the intensive high yielding side, or as I put um, my co-originator, uh, Bill Mollison over here, actually more extreme, extreme rationalist than me, I think, uh, but more into the wild um, uh, natural approach to, to gardening. Uh, so just recognizing this freedom to do things in different ways that suit not just the site, and the situation and the household context, uh, but also what, what is the gardener into? What is the person into? Because the person is central in these systems. Yeah, I really love that you brought all of that together so that it, you know, you've got biodynamics and biointensive and organics and permaculture and different types of permaculture, forest gardening, wilderness gardening. And it's not like there's one or other of this. It's not a dogmatic thing, like you're saying. Yep. I think that's a really important um, point to bring in. Um, I, I wanted to ask you too, because 
one one approach is this retro suburbia, like the retrofitting of suburbia. I wonder if you've been approached by councils or developers or planners to talk about, well, how can you take these retro suburbia concepts and apply it in the development of new suburban areas so you don't have to retrofit later, you're actually doing it well in the first instance? Mm. Yeah, I haven't been. And I think uh, basically a lot of the forces driving uh, new suburban development are incredibly constrained by the regulatory system, which has already got its own version of built-in environmental perspectives, right through to the, the savage economics of uh, how this stuff all happens with public and private capital, and then the madness of the property market. You know, this insane world we live in where um, you know, the, the theoretical value of land um, is, is really just a casino. And all of those realities that are constraining what um, uh, developers do means that is, is sort of quite difficult. It was interesting, um, uh, colleague um, uh, who, who died uh, recently, Dan Palmer, in his consultancy work, he actually took on uh, a high-rise development uh, where the developer wanted to do something different with rooftop gardens. And Dan kept pushing back and saying, well, no, these are my conditions. And the developer kept saying, yeah, I, I can make sure you have the say over the architects and the engineers and whatever. And it was interesting process where he he got all of his criteria met for actually engaging in that process. Um, and in discussing that, we felt that the developer was sort of reflecting on all the developments he'd done and what was his legacy going to be? And was there something really worthwhile that he was contributing? And so he was prepared in that situation and presumably being fairly successful to sort of try uh, different things. But I think I still see, because the risks that the property bubble um, of it bursting, and even though I've been saying that for a long time, um, we actually have this huge stock of housing already, and we have enough houses to house everyone. Houses and apartments and and buildings that can be retrofitted. So the future building industry in uh, a finance constrained world, once the casino bubble blows up, will only be retrofitting. In my opinion, there won't be any new suburbs built um, there, because there will be no economic model or basis for doing it. Mm. So in that sense, I'm less interested in in that area too even though we still see this template uh rolling uh rolling out yeah i'm just very conscious of it where i live up here in the sunshine coast it's <laughs> massive amount of development and not a single sign of 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 this there so i, I kind of well it, of course, it's quite present is... for me in my in my everyday yeah well it's it here too in hepburn the acceleration with all the fabricated money created by governments following COVID, as a huge amount of that has gone into this, what uh, the re-elected uh, Premier of Victoria calls the big build. <laughs> you know, more infrastructure and more stuff to uh, stimulate the economy, which has been so extreme, of course, there's been chronic shortages of building materials and yeah. uh, massive cost uh, increases. So I suppose um, with our Aussie Street story, you know, we uh, part of it was to sort of just um, reflect on the shared history of where suburbia has come from and, and where it's going to. But it was also to challenge the 
the planning orthodoxy that um, uh, that higher density was the solution to the the problems of of suburbia in field development and yeah. and higher density and yeah, you know we a we did major narrative that's right yeah, yeah. that uh, meta analysis of Aussie Street which is, is a bit of a joke because you know you're doing a, a statistical analysis of the data from a made up story <laughs> but it's actually you know and that was me poking fun at academics and and you know where there was really very little research on the whole um, density meme, which was, in my view, really a cargo cult where you build more buildings and that will achieve the population densities necessary for urban amenity and efficiency. So we've covered over all these areas, but um, with more buildings, <laughs> wiped out all the gardens. But actually some of the actual number of people per square kilometre in these places has actually not shifted because of all the other factors of, of uh, family breakups, aging of the population and people just living in bigger and bigger houses as um, investment um, scams and yeah, not really occupying and people having two and three houses and mobile lifestyles while someone else is living in a car. <laughs> you know, David, uh, I've, I've just noticed what the time is. So oh, I'm... Yeah. I'm wanting to go to questions soon because I feel like yeah. there's a lot of people here who'd love to talk to you. But there's one last question before we hand over. So yep. if you want to start, those people who are listening, if you want to start, you know, popping your hand up using the reactions button so we can um, we can see who's there, that would be great. But my my question that I wanted to to ask you was about considering our global situation with these massive global crises and the scale of the change that we need to see. How what is possible, do you think, through this lens of retro suburbia and permaculture to address what we're facing? Yeah, well, I think in the right conditions, viral replication of small scale working responses can be uh, as potent and in fact more potent in that that context that I said where you get a freezing of the, you know, the um, finance and things like war and pandemics and all of these factors can just mean that the small scale solutions that are beginning in the household uh, level um, can be very potent, but they're also far more adaptable to rapidly changing conditions than big, powerful top down responses. And they also avoid a lot of the worst of the collateral damage that happens from those powerful solutions. And I think we've seen that a big top-down powerful solution, um, corporate responses uh, to COVID are just emblematic of that rush of power and from the top in response to uh, crisis. And it, uh, it, it, it changes things really fast really fast, but often in the wrong direction. Uh, so I think there is a lot of potential to respond to those crises from the bottom. Um, and I, I suppose I see that as also combining in building the, our own resilience and focus on kickstarting that household and community non-monetary economies in the process, we are actually radically reducing our participation, support and dependence on those top-down responses. And that is sort of like a, a, a collective strike, which has a huge impact on the system if a significant number of people do it. And so there's now um, environmental activism starting to align with these sort of ideas, like a new one I became aware of called uh, the global walkout campaign of uh, people, you know, acting to stop using their credit card and just using uh, cash to buy things, and you know, downscaling and doing things themselves as a deliberate strike against the way those centralised systems are working. Mm, thanks, David. Well, I wonder whether you might want to just stop sharing your screen, so then we can yep. see. 
other people. Yeah. And um, all right, so we've got um, Sarah. Do you want to unmute yourself and and um, ask you ask your question? Hi, Sarah. Hi, David and Morag. Um, I was listening to your podcast today um, that you guys did together in 2020, and David made mention of um, wood burning and his feelings around that um, in the urban environment. And I, I don't expect you to kind of go into it here, but I, just, I, I was really curious about that and wondering whether you could just send me to your um, to your stuff on that, where maybe you've documented your thoughts around wood burning. Um, yeah, there's a, a few essays on the website and an early one from 2003 when I started to notice the, uh, you know, the greater demonisation of wood as as polluting, primitive and inefficient compared with modern renewables. And uh, so that was a, an, an early piece, but there's a, a major um, uh, piece called um, Bushfire resilient uh, land and climate care of arguing that thinning our regrowth forests, especially the dense ones around our fire vulnerable residential areas mm. has dual essential land management function, but also then produces as a byproduct biomass that like in Europe can be used for energy in technically complex uh, ways that are completely uh, pollution free or in simple technologies like uh, rocket stoves and others that are very, very low um, uh, pollution levels. And obviously, one of the things of, about this is there's sometimes a sense that um, if a technology or a way of doing things can't be done by everyone in a nation, then it's not valid. <laughs> uh, and this is the difference between the world we've come from, where that one big solution tended to trump all other solutions. And we're moving to a world where there's lots and lots of different ones. And I think are definitely at the suburban scale, um, efficient use of wood for cooking and heating and processing food, especially in extended family or uh, larger households, um, even relatively inefficient technology like is commonly available with um, wood burning stoves uh, that, you know, they meet all the Australian standards, but they wouldn't necessarily meet the European clean air standards. Mm -hmm. So um, there is quite a lot, there's a whole chapter on that in Retro Suburbia too, oh, great, great. Um, yeah. because mm -hmm. we saw it as such an important issue. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank, Thank you, Sarah. You. Thank you, David. So um, we're putting the link to Retro Suburbia in the, in the chat as well. Uh, so you can follow up there if you've not already. And also, um, David's publishing company, Meliodora Publishing, um, has offered a, a, um, a gift book pack, uh, which we're going to uh, send, uh, send you a form. And if you fill that out and we, we're asking you what's something that's uh, a learning from today and then we'll pick a, a winner from that. So I think there's a, there's a Retro Suburbia book, uh, um, the Our Street, a calendar, and I think also permaculture pioneers in that in that pack. So um, yeah, Stacy's going to drop that into the chat, the form. So fill that in and to to get into the um, into the the draw for that. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge that we are about to go to the top of the hour. If it's okay with you, David, just to stick around for a little bit longer to maybe answer a couple more questions. And I would like to invite everyone who can stay to stick around. But I understand if you do need to go, um, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure to have your company. Um, so yeah, I happy, first, happy to, sorry, David. <laughs> happy happy to answer uh, a few more questions. Okay, thank you. So firstly, um, maybe I'll just ask Clinton whether he's noticed any questions in the chat before we go to you, Justin. Yeah, there's been quite an interesting discussion going on there, but um, I'll kind of it's kind of split into three different ways. A lot of people were discussing the implications of an aging population and the increase in the single person households and split families and stuff like that. How do you see that affecting kind of 
suburbia and kind of how that might change like agro suburbia in the future? Yeah, well, this is a big one that um, I wrote about in some of the essays leading up to the Retro Suburbia book and suggesting that this strategy of people sharing their houses, uh, older people who own, is an incredibly important uh, imperative for their own well-being, even though it involves navigating this ambiguous power relationship in some degree of intimacy with people who are not owners. And that similarly, young people need to focus on where they can get connected to space without it costing them a fortune in rent and but also get over that thing that I can't do anything unless I own a place and bypass the real estate agents and connect people who own with people who have the energy and power to do things. So somehow we've got to get those two groups together and then amazing things can happen. But obviously these psychosocial limits to, oh, my privacy, my space, or I don't own anything, so I can't do anything. Those things need to be broken down and they will be broken down by tough economic circumstances. And we're already seeing that in the United States. Average household size, the number of people living together is actually going back up again. Interesting. Mm. Clinton, was there another question you wanted to ask from the chat? Because I can see it has been very, very active. Thank you, everyone, for being so active in the chat. Um, yeah. We'll take one more question from the chat and then we'll go to Justin, I think. Yeah, another one that came up that a lot of people were discussing is the idea of community gardens in Australia can be quite a hard push against the councils. I know that particularly that's the with my Melton council where I'm in Melbourne, it's, it's quite a hard sell. But what do you think that some of those roadblocks are? And do you think that it's achievable to have a more European style of allotments in Australia? Yeah, look, a lot of the regulatory and bureaucratic impediments are, are sort of getting worse and worse, which is one of the reasons why we strategically focused on the private space where people can just get on with stuff. But we also recognise that not just in, in higher and medium density areas, but also in a lot of these outer suburbs of the houses built virtually to the boundaries, there's actually very little space for food growing often. And we, we modelled that in one of the example designs. Um, uh, but there's often a lot of public space in these newer suburbs that's often just a lot of it mown grass. So one of the things we see and we talked about in retro suburbia is the informal occupation of space and whether that's like a group of people actually doing a gorilla garden or it's someone walking their goats and tethering their goats out on the common with some sort of social license from neighbors but not necessarily all ag agreed to by the council you know that these push pull factors and we've certainly in our own community here had community garden efforts even in a um, uh, a small town where you would think people have plenty of access to to land but some of those things came about through basically direct action occupation of council land that then were navigated back through and formalized um, so it is you know I mean some people are very good at working methodically through all the stakeholder issues and sometimes it takes years um, and other people are more working at the fringes of, of pushing the boundaries either as an individual with just informal social license or as a group of people. Mm, thanks David and I know that um, the last masterclass we hosted was with a number of people who are um, Churchill Fellows uh, with Urban Agriculture Community Gardens and I know that just heading to um, to, I think, federal government at the moment to try and advocate for community gardens uh, throughout Australia. So, you know, I think there's a lot of people working in this space mm. and I think the idea is to, you know, get involved in Community Gardens Australia and to be voices locally where you are to support this. Um, all right, I'm going to hand over to you now, Justin. Thanks, Clinton. Thanks a lot. 
Hi there. Uh, yeah, thanks, David, for taking the questions. Um, as I live in a flat, and I'm a recent flat owner, um, mortgaged, of course, but solar and water capture and growing space in like the typical 1980s built flats. There's so many of them around. There's a lot of good surface area on the roof space as well for solar. Um, and I know my flat, there's when I bought the place, I received a copy of uh, the maintenance plan. And in a few years time, the roof is due for replacement. And after which it won't be due for replacement for a very long time after that. So maybe mm. time to, to add solar. Um, you know, there are very few documented examples of retrofitting these types of buildings. Mm. But a couple of really good ones on your website um, and even some in Brisbane. I'm in Brisbane. Uh, uh, right, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was great to um, have... The, yeah, the first case study on the Retro Suburbia website that was pushing into that territory, even though it's not a territory we looked at sort of closely in the book. Sure, yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of us who are interested in this do live in this type of situation. Um, so a few questions there. What advice would you have for anyone who's wanting to make progress in this area and kind of take on body court policy? Um where can major steps be taken? Uh, maybe some kind of, or uh, is is it a is it should it be a grassroots thing? Owner occupies pushing hard, or just kind of going ahead and doing it and copying a slap on the hand? Um, or can there um, also be? Is this scope for some green lobbying uh, to influence policy in this area? Mm. Well, I think it's a mixture of those things, and I think one in the middle would be um, being able to see and visit examples where people had through their uh, body corporate or owners corporation managed to, uh, if not collectively do all this stuff like the um, ha happened, uh, I'm trying to think of um, his name. Uh, Gavin Hardy, I think. Gavin Hardy, yeah, and the way uh, he sort of um, provided a, a bit of leadership role in that and doing the, if you like, the work um, uh, to sort of encourage others who are sort of then become tolerant of what it is at least. Uh, so really allowing uh, a, a private, one of the owners to sort of uh, take some on some, uh, license to use some some space, so I think is is part of that process. And I think yeah, being able to see examples and also building the social capital with other owners of exchange and direct things makes it a lot easier. You know, when there's sort of like exchange of produce, and wouldn't it be good to produce more? And mm. uh, and being able to go and visit somewhere else to sort of make real those things for people rather than it just being a concept. I think that's really important. Uh, but there's, yeah, the, the processes of also of risk management, a more sort of conventional uh, managerial approach within a body corporate to say, look, these are the hazards we potentially face, um, you know, electricity costs, you know, uh, more intense um, uh, weather events. These are real things that that we as owners have to deal with. You know, here's some of the strategies that we could be doing, you know, and, you know, that they could include a range of things that most people aren't necessarily thinking about, but when they think about it as threat and threat to their asset or investment, they they may be more interested in, in yeah, those. I think I think that languaging is really important, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it could be timing too, because when I moved into this place, there's eight units. I was the only owner occupier. Now there's four of us. Yeah. So yeah, the that's that's right. the that's the big one, of course. Yeah, because the absentee investor owner is is yeah. always more it's like of picking a your time when to pounce or yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or to, 
to, to gather people around and um, yeah, tackle it. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. I, I just want to see whether there's any one last question. Do you think, Clinton, that you would like to drop into? Uh... Uh, yeah, I'm just kind of just looking through my list. Um, oh, another one, a cheeky question. Is there another publication coming from you soon, David? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, are, what, are you, what are you tending to at the moment, David? What are you working on and uh, are you putting your energy? Well, apart from supporting the ongoing rollout of retro suburbia and encouraging more case studies and uh, those sorts of things, I'm also working at uh, two other levels, I suppose. One, one is this biomass energy integration with how we deal with the fire problem, how we deal with dispatchable energy from woody biomass and that that's actually part of a transport solution. And it's one of those things that is both can be done by viral replication like retro suburbia, but it also has the potential to scale in the conventional sense, which also makes it a risk where the solution can turn back into the old problem, you know, like overcutting the forests or whatever. So that, uh, you know, because that's one of my passions has been for a long time and we continuing to work on that. And the other uh, is similar in its potential to be viral replication, but also scaling. And that's the marine permaculture uh, concept um, of Brian von Herzen and uh, uh, Brian and myself and uh, another author are about to have a, um, uh, a piece published in a, a peer-reviewed scientific journal looking at permaculture ethics and design principles as a framework for con for constraining and guiding what's called the blue economy of this exploitation of the oceans yeah yeah great. So they're the sort of yeah other things at the bigger scale that yeah. i'm involved in at the moment i wonder just as a last last comment david whether you know, talked about this viral replication as being the way that you know i i always think of it as a kind of a, a myceliation of of this work mm. from what you've seen of how this is working with the whole retro suburbia world how do you encourage or recommend people to get involved in that to facilitate or amplify or add compost to this myceliation process? Yeah, well, I think it, it, it does get down to that reviewing one's own circumstances and having standing back from the, the mass media messaging about what's important in the world and looking at things from one's own lens and especially at the household level of, of thinking about uh, those vulnerabilities, thinking about issues like debt and how serious a hazard that is for, some, for so many people and how our authorities are completely irresponsible and really should be regarded as the enemy because they're not warning people that, you know, huge numbers of people are going to go down with, with what's coming financially and in other ways because they're holding, they don't want to scare the horses. So they're not telling, giving you the information of, of, of what's around. So that, and although that can be a sort of a reaction through fear, it's also about that empowered ability to remind ourselves of, of what we were as kids to just, what do we want to do? What do we really want to do with our lives and our time? You know, what have we got? And, uh, you know, not be, oh, I have to do this. I have to do this to climb up the ladder I'm on or uh, whatever. So I think there's opportunities for a lot of people as a result of COVID making very deep sort of re-evaluations of uh, things. And it doesn't mean to say necessarily a majority are doing that, but at this stage, it's a, a really important to get that empowered minority doing that and providing more 
examples because when things twist, it's actually people looking to those people, oh, how do we do this? Yeah. And we need that everywhere. Yeah. So one of the things that you do encourage people to do as well is to start up retro suburbia book clubs as well like get a group of people together yep. or read the book together look at what what it means in your local area or so i really encourage people to do that it's a great way to start to to get that like you said that that activated minority in a way those people who are aware and who are really motivated to do something kind of lead the way and yep. uh, open the doors and open the the lens of possibility. I think is really a lot of what it's about, isn't it? You know, yeah. oh, oh, look at that. There is a different way of of doing things here, and I think that's great. And and speaking up about it in in you know positive ways that invite other people to get involved. And in, you know, at your flat, Justin, you know, inviting people over for a for a dinner, or a local food feast, or having it out in the gardens or something. Or, you know, really. Being being a host, <laughs> being a host of this kind of way of thinking and inviting people to come and join you seems to me to be a really positive way forward. I know that's how we got Northeast Street City Farm started. It was just by mm. inviting people to come and eat a lot of food with us in the park. And, yeah. and it just grew from that, you know. So I think food that's a beautiful is the, And that's why food is so central in this whole thing because it's something that everyone connects to yeah. um, a lot more fundamentally than they connect to solar panels or <laughs> or some of the other elements of of uh system yeah uh, and that builds a relationship builds a relationship of trust that you know that web of relationships that you need to be able to then allow this all to to take place and in in invite the um local councillor or invite the you know whoever it is where is that place that you're wanting to sort of have a bit of influence to to bring them in along to it too so Thank you so much, David, for taking the time to join us here today. It's been absolutely wonderful to, to dive into these um, threads of conversation with you. I know there's been so, so much chat going on here. Um, I will be um, recording. I have recorded this and I'll send this out back out to you um, and feel free to share it around. We'd love more people to hear this. And I also just too wanted to thank everyone who was able to make a donation. And This is a free event and all of the events like this that we run are free. And whenever you make a donation here, we send 100% of it um, across to uh, refugee perma youth programs that are doing um, amazing work so this we we raised fourteen hundred and nineteen dollars tonight so thank you for that and all of that is going to go directly to um, support a perma youth program to do a perma youth course in nakavalu refugee sentiment in uganda so thank you everyone for that i really appreciate it and i'll send you information later on too about how that's going so you can see all right. Well, thank you, David. Thank you, Stacey and Clinton for helping host and thank all of you for being here. It's lovely to have your company tonight. Thank you, Morag, for all of your amazing work and uh, positivity over years and now decades Does with permaculture. <laughs> Don't tell anyone how old I am, David. <laughs> thank you, David. Thank you for being here. Good night, everyone.